All right, here we go. Okay, hi everyone. Just wait until everybody's into the into the chat here. Hope everybody had a good weekend. All right. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it was a little quieter. A little quieter. How about other other folks? Um, I understand with COVID, um, some of you may be here in town. Some of you uh, probably are not. I'm uh, I'm way in the south, sir, in a you know bar haven. So I don't I haven't heard any honking besides I think one, uh, which was like real early in the morning at one. Someone drove around honking and then they stopped. <laughs> but that was about it. <laughs> well, that's that's good. I, I mean, yeah. it could it could be worse for me. I mean, I understand that Centertown um, is is where the honking was was the worst. Um, here in the here in the market, it, it was kind of like that. People driving around, and you could hear stuff going on on the hill. But yeah. Oh, Amia was woken up. Yeah, I mean, geez, uh, I I figured uh, well. State of emergency, which, uh, good, but uh, they, I think they should have done that last weekend. I don't know why um, it wasn't done last weekend, but the other thing that concerns me is that I have another class, and um, I'm supposed to teach it in person tomorrow, and I'm kind of like, do I have to go through this uh, giant bunch of noise and honking and uh you know crowds of people that are that are uh yelling at folks for wearing masks i don't know i don't know if i want to do that i don't know um <laughs> yeah yeah that may be what i do emily i've got to check with the boss that's professor larivay <laughs> I, I i'll have to check with the department chair and, and get her her advice because you know i'm i'm not just thinking about me i'm thinking like oh man like are my students going to want to traverse this nonsense if they have to uh if they live in the downtown area you know so suppose we'll see we will see <coughs> anyway we may have occasion to get back to discussion about this um later on in the lecture and that's because uh, what I'd like to do today is simply finish uh, the chapter on technocracy. So the slides, as you can see, are really not very long. Uh, I'll go ahead, Annabelle. Uh, first off, sorry, yeah, just every prof and teacher I've known uh, mispronounces, but it's just an e-blade. I'm sorry, an e It's perfectly fine. I'm, I'm used so to sorry. it now. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's all good. I'm, I'm just like, it's not really, um, affect me too much obviously anymore because I'm, I'm used to just correcting it perfectly fine i'm like in the mindset of people will always mis uh, mispronounce it but uh yeah i just have one quick question about sure. the um essay uh, the, at least the prompt uh, you said like starting the prompt you said specifically a couple weeks back that the, you're kind of writing your plan of attack you said so i don't know if for say the essay prompt is more of just uh, less kind of you mentioning okay this is my thesis statement here are the you know topics i want to discuss about here's how i would create the first body paragraph the second body paragraph the third and then the conclusion could maybe just you know it's just a reiteration of the obviously the intro so i don't know if that should be left out of the prompt part and more of in the yeah. final well the idea i guess the the way that i like to to encourage students to think about writing their proposals is that the whole proposal if you take out like the the subsections like um mm -hmm. if you take out the topic thesis subset and just put all of what you've written together it should work as uh, as your like opening paragraph or two right 
or or at least it can be reworked into that with a little tweaking so your you know your topic is just to sort of kind of contour things like here's what i'm going to be talking about and here's how i get from this this area of interest to my thesis and the plan of attack is sort of just like how you think you'll go about doing it so maybe you'll want to for example argue that i don't know let's make our area of interest technocracy uh since that's what we're talking about today so you could just say my area of interest is technocracy which is um rule by technical experts and then your your thesis or research question could be um uh is technocracy a threat to democracy that could make a good um, research question. And your answer to that question will effectively be your thesis statement, right? Uh, and that could be something like, in this paper, I will argue that, um, in this paper, I will argue that uh, technocracy, um, when, limited, um, when limited by the same checks and balances as democracy, uh, is not a threat to democracy itself or something. And then your plan of attack would be like, whose work you're going to talk about, what kind mm -hmm. of argument you're going to make. Are you going to make a positive argument, a negative argument, an adjudicative argument, right? And I'm going to cover all of this in, um, I'm going to make a separate, like a video that will be separate from the lectures that I'll post to my channel, which will talk about how to approach the essay writing lecture uh, how, or sorry, how to approach the essay topic proposal and the essay itself. So, yeah, but that's the idea, I guess. Yeah, in a okay. I, I think I had the general uh, approach. I think I was going to, like, even if I didn't ask, this would have been, like, if I did the prompt, it would have been fine. But yeah, I just wanted to make sure, because I know, you know, it's it's the fifth week now, and we've yeah. gotten through three, almost three chapters or four now. And, um, you know, there's, certain topics that I've had interest in and I actually do, you know, form the questions and whatnot. So yeah, I might as well start early than, you know, the, the week before, right? Like that's, as some people do. Exactly. <laughs> no, that's uh, exactly right. Uh, that's yeah. exactly right. Um, it's always better to, to, to be a little bit proactive when it comes to this stuff. Um, and uh, I'm just going to read out one question uh, that might be uh, useful for anyone obviously watching this, uh, the video portion, but uh, do we need an an uh, annotated bibliography uh, for the proposal or is that going to be left for the actual like essay that we'll be submitting during the um, uh, exam period? Uh, yeah, you should include a bibliography um, uh, for the proposal. Um, it's up to you whether you'd like to annotate it um because yeah i mean it's really up to you uh for those who don't know an annotated bibliography is just a bibliography that not only includes sources but an explanation of those sources so um you know maybe the textbook is in there so you'd reference that you'd cite the textbook and then you would say uh val duzek is an author uh on uh he writes about philosophy of technology and uh, this is our course textbook you know something simple like that you can do that if you want um <clears throat> it doesn't have to be exhaustive you know just to get to the last part of henrique's question uh here your bibliography doesn't have to be exhaustive you should at least cite the textbook uh maybe some of my lectures and maybe if you found one other source you should cite that but it you know i expect that you're going to find even more sources as you keep working right so uh and the textbook is a good way to do that you know as we read through the textbook and see who duzek is talking about you know go and look at their work right um so yeah so as you can see let me just try and full screen my slides as you can see the slides for today are not very long um that is because i just want to finish the chapter oh i don't want to record i want to have my slideshow uh yeah that's because i don't want to really you know i don't want to get into the next chapter just yet i was hoping that um uh our discussion of this chapter could inspire some some chit chat about technocracy um and the current uh pandemic situation because obviously technocracy uh we can see how technocracy has kind of played a role in 
uh, Canada's response to the pandemic, of course. And we can see how it has um, perhaps played less of a role in certain other uh, nation states, more of a role in yet others. Um, and whether, you know, whether this is um, something that we should cons be concerned about or whether this is what we ought to be doing, uh, you know, just a little back and forth kind of chit chat about technocracy and democracy. So I thought that would be kind of fun. But before that, we just have to finish the chapter really quick. So we left off talking about uh, uh, Torstein Veblen, uh, technocrats in the 20th century in America. And now we get to this um, post-industrial society theory that some uh, technocratic thinkers advocate. Uh, Duzek uh, describes, uh, uh, you know, kind of gives us gives us a sort of historical context here, right? I remember when we were talking about um, Veblen uh, and uh, and uh, oh, who were the other two Swedish thinkers? Um, I can't remember their names now, but um, you know, we, we were we were going up up till about the nineteen fifties. Um, now we pick up from the 1950s and quote, during the 1950s, 1960s and 1970s in the USA, the welfare states of Europe and the communist USSR, technocratic tendencies were influential in theories of government. During the new frontier of the presidency of John F. Kennedy and the great society of Lyndon Johnson in the USA and in the labor government of Harold Wilson in the UK, technocratic notions were afloat among advisors. And this certainly makes sense. I mean, um, <clears throat> let's 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 kind of break down what Duzik is saying here. Um, the welfare states of Europe. He's talking about. Well, I'm sure you are familiar with the term welfare state. Uh, if you hear this term in the news, you know there's that sort of um, there's that sort of Fox News kind of welfare state. Um, that you might hear talked about um, by certain pundits. Um, you know, uh, we're talking uh, uh, we're talking government handouts, uh, right? Yeah, but really, yeah, Stefan, really, uh, you've nailed it. It's actually social democracies. So countries like Sweden, Norway, um, I mean, well, heck, pretty much all the Scandinavian countries, really. Um, like I was in Denmark for a conference once. And I was chit chatting with some grad students there. Oh, that's that's right. They were both named mods. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, they were both mods. Like, I'm like, hey, I'm Josh. I'm mods. Other guys like, I'm also mods. I was like, do you two know each other? I was like, no. Um, but yeah, Abraham. Yeah, that's right. You know, you hear the certain oh, the welfare state, the nanny state. Get a job right? The Fox News kind of kind of spin on it, right? But really what it means is a social democratic state um, like the Nordic countries, right? Where, uh, as I was saying, I'm talking with the two mods from Denmark um, and uh, I'm like, yeah, man, uh, I have to pay my student loans back after grad school. And they're both like, that sucks, <laughs> you know? So I asked them, what's it like in Denmark? And they say, well, you know, um, your tuition is covered uh, as long as you keep your grades up. And I thought, wow, that's nice. But then again, Canada is kind of somewhere in the middle. We're not quite fully Nordic country. We're not quite American style. You know, we still have to pay tuition here, but our tuition is mostly sub subsidized by the government. Um, that is why tuition in Canada, for Canadian citizens at least, is so much less expensive than tuition at most American universities, right? So that's what they're talking about there. They're talking about social democracies to differentiate them from the communist system in the USSR. And again, this is a lot of pundits will equate the two, right? You know, uh, you get those bad takes from certain uh, conservative and neoconservative thinkers uh, that say, um, uh, socialized uh, medicine or universal basic income uh, is communism. Uh, it's not. Um, communism is when the, the state owns the means of production. Um, so 
This is not the case in social democracies, which arguably Canada is maybe not like Sweden or Norway, but part like we we tend that way. Um, and uh, technocratic tendencies were obviously influential in those theories of government. We've seen how they were influential in the USSR, and you can see how they would have to be influential in, you know, these these welfare states as well, because the idea is to uh, the idea is to redistribute wealth um, to make society more equitable, more just. And obviously, <laughs> you'll probably need some economic experts if you want to pull that off, right? Yeah, and uh, Kennedy and then, well, Lyndon Johnson. Um, uh, Lyndon Johnson was, if I'm not mistaken, he was Kennedy's uh, vice president, wasn't he? And then Kennedy was assassinated. Um, a lot of uh, social changes uh, going on at the time, you know, this is the civil rights movement is happening right now in the United States. Um, we're kind of past the 50s, past McCarthyism, you know, uh, we're in a very politically charged, politically polarized time today. Uh, this was the case in the 50s as well with McCarthyism, the, the Senator uh, Joseph McCarthy, who was a um, you know, would kind of lead, lead these anti-communist witch hunts. Um, and it was quite, 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 quite extreme, quite partisan. But yeah, when we had the civil rights movement, uh, we, Kennedy and later Johnson, and uh, Johnson was the one I think who actually got the Civil Rights Act passed. Uh, and of course, the space race was also happening now. Uh, the Cold War was still going on. We had the space race. And same in the UK, we had the Labour government around the same time in the United Kingdom. And for those who aren't in the know, the Labour government is like the UK's equivalent of the New Democratic Party. It's their Social Democratic Party. So <clears throat> among the advisors to these governments, uh, there was a lot of techno technocratic thinking. And of course, technocratic thinking has always been influential in, oh, excuse me in industry and in the military. And this is evidenced by, um, I think, President Eisenhower's um, farewell address. Duzik describes, uh, he, he says this, he says, quote, President Dwight Eisenhower in his 1960 farewell address famously warned of the growing power of the military industrial complex, the complex of large corporations producing military armaments and the Pentagon bureaucracy. You've probably heard that term before. But it's another one of those terms that tends to get thrown around loosely by, um, by pundits, even by conspiracy theorists. But it's an actual thing that Eisenhower was concerned about. Um, uh, you know, um, companies make a lot of money uh, building machinery to kill people, right? Um, and the military needs to use it to show that it works. To get more stuff, the military needs to use the stuff that it has. And Eisenhower worried that this um, creates a sort of complex, you know, where um, military industry, you know, you know, the, the, it's like like a war machine can build itself, um, uh, and that's not good. Right. And Eisenhower would know. Right. Because before Eisenhower was the president, uh, Eisenhower was a general in the United States Army. Uh, Eisenhower was was the. Um, actually, the 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 supreme European commander um, uh, in Europe uh, when the allies were pushing the Nazis back um, back into Germany uh, just toward the end of the war. So so he he knew. Uh, he was a military man, uh, a general, um, and he saw this. Um, uh, he saw this, and you can see this, you can kind of see what he's talking about when you look at the difference between, um, you know, military, military production, military factories during the First and Second World War and other conflicts prior to that, right? I mean, in the Second World War, think about it. You've got assembly lines, uh, which is something that we didn't really see um, before, right? 
Uh, Henry Ford was the fellow who um, really made use of the assembly line, mass production of military equipment, which needs to be used. Uh, and, and when it's used, then you need to build more. This is why, this is how the United States emerged as a superpower after the Second World War. Um, and arguably likewise with the USSR, right? Got a question here. Yeah, production begets production, right? Um, if I've got lots of planes, and, and certainly the Germans too. The Germans were, were, were on this stuff uh, in the run-up to the war because... Uh, and th this is this is the thing. Uh, national socialism is not socialism, but it did have a fair amount of uh, what you might want to call state capitalism, right? Um, the state um, telling factories what to build, um, that kind of thing, right? And 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 uh, this is what enabled the Nazis blitzkrieg. Uh, during the beginning of the war was they had built a war machine that uh, had thousands of planes and tanks and guns and um, they were ready to go and and the allied powers were not among other things uh, that are beyond the scope of this class but yeah these are all examples of what Eisenhower was was afraid of right so we want to we, we need we need some people to manage this right or consider another example that I think is discussed in the textbook is the Manhattan Project, right? Who knows about the Manhattan Project? It's pretty, pretty famous. Yes, exactly. Big kabooms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Robert Oppenheimer, what did he write in his journal after, after the program? I have become deaf. Um, he was the scientist who was leading that program. So even if you look at something like mutually assured destruction, right? So the Americans get the bomb. They drop it on Japan. Um, the Second World War ends. And we think, okay, fine, war's over. Um, we rebuild Europe. We rebuild Japan. The USSR, they're going to keep doing their thing, but whatever. Um but uh, the Russians want the bomb. Uh, and, and certain Western allies, they want the bomb. The UK, France, they want the bomb. So now everybody's got the bomb. Um, and we want to not use it. But the only way to not use it is to make sure everyone has it and will use it. So that if you use it, not only am I destroyed, you're destroyed too. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fire my nuclear missiles when you fire yours. Mutually assured destruction. I mean, geez, what the heck were we doing in the 20th century? I mean, really? Well, so in the USA and in Germany uh, during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, one claim that was floating around was that ideology had actually become irrelevant. Political ideology here. Uh, so we're not, we're not talking about things like uh what's better is capitalism better is marxism socialism communism better no we're not doing that uh what we're doing is we're just kind of tinkering with things and we're fine-tuning things we're just kind of making little adjustments to society and the economy technical experts are the ones that are helping us do this right so let's not worry about capitalism or socialism or anything and let's just tweak things to get them to work better right and that thesis is called the end of ideology thesis uh, but of course in the ussr um there was a very dominant ideology <sighs> perhaps not as dominant as in stalin's days but still quite dominant and that's marxist leninism communism you know marx was the along with Engels, the sort of uh, founder of communism. Lenin's the, uh, the guy who led the Russian Revolution um, and kind of puts his own spin on it. And Stalin also um, it just comes along and makes everything way eviler. It's not like uh, Lenin was a, was, a, was a good guy himself. Uh, he was no angel, but uh, Stalin certainly was a devil. Um, <clears throat> so in the USSR, until it fell, uh, which was when, 89? Uh, it remained the dominant ideology uh, and technocracy was applied 
through that ideology. I mean, think about think about what one of the one of the events. I'm 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 winging it. I'm winging this here. But what was one of the events that precipitated the downfall of the Soviet Union? Oh, first we'll ask here. Yeah, uh, we'll answer this. Um, Marxist Leninism, Stalinism, or are they distinct? I'd say that uh, Marxist Leninism is a sub branch of Marxism. And Stalinism is still it is its own kind of thing. I mean, Stalinism is Stalinism to me implies ruthless, just a, just a yeah, like a like a ruthless application of Marxist Leninist ideas. Uh, go go ahead, Jonah. So. Um... I, there's a Marxist Leninism is Stalin's name for his own thing because he's, you know, he based it off of the ideas of Marx and Lenin. Yeah. Um, so to say you're a Marxist Leninist does not mean you're a, uh, uh, following in the, in the lineage of Marx and Lenin, but that you are following Stalin. Right. It's, it, it, it's crazy how, how he managed to, you know, you keep those names separate. They mean, those individual people, but you combine them now. You now it means a different guy. It means a yeah. different, different <laughs> ideology entirely. It's very Orwellian. Um, yeah, the way the way Stalin operated, right? Um, and and yeah, that's that's an interesting example of that. Um, kind of new speakish. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as for the the other question you asked, things that precipitated the downfall of the Soviet Union. The one thing I could think of is like um, uh, the like uh what do they call them the, the like collectivized farming in ukraine oh yeah um the collective well that 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 was wasn't that kind of like an earlier an early on kind of thing um or i could was, be wrong it was i mean it, it was a thing they they've been ramping up towards yeah. um but yeah the, the hollow dome or yeah, because because um, Ukraine was kind of the the breadbasket of the USSR, um, kind of like the prairies, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but they, when they when the, it wasn't quite the yield they were expecting, mm. um, the ideology kind of consumed itself, and, right? And uh. They went, well, you know, we, we predicted that this would make us the perfect Marxist society. And, and well, it turns out we didn't get the grain yields we were expecting this one year. So it was definitely traitors out there. And so we're going to intentionally kill them. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So, well, that could be one thing. Um, just before I finish uh, yeah. uh, what I was going to say, uh, Dominic, uh, Maoism is interesting, too, because Maoism is a different kind of communism, right? Uh, they kind of they didn't go in the Soviet direction. I don't know as much about Maoism though, right? Um, so I, I I can't really speak to that very much. But if someone else wants to jump in, um, I'd say the fall of the Berlin Wall was was a more of a sign of the times. What I'm thinking of is actually the Chernobyl disaster, um, which kind of laid bare the in the 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 in the inadequacies of the uh you know of the sort of technocratic system that the USSR had in place but the thing is unlike the other things that we've mentioned like you know um you know uh collectivized farming failures the whole world could see this the whole world could see what was going on um so for those who don't know, the, uh, the Chernobyl was one of the worst nuclear disasters in history where a meltdown was, uh, was initiated at the Chernobyl plant, uh, which is in, uh, this is in Ukraine. Uh, you can visit Chernobyl today uh, and everything is all overgrown. Everything, so nature, yeah, and nature has reclaimed it. Animals have come to live there, it's fascinating. 
And now, as Enrique says, yeah, there's an HBO miniseries, which does a pretty good job, I think, of, of kind of showing you what's up. Dominic, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to talk a bit more about the just Chernobyl and Maoism from just my own uh, research on it. Uh, so it's just a reason why Chernobyl was uh, such a huge impact on the Soviet Union is because like you had uh, observatories in like Sweden and Western Europe detecting the nuclear fallout before the Soviet Union even reported it to its own citizens. So you could yeah. be living outside of Chernobyl, see the explosion hear nothing about it from the government and have like the west being like oh chernobyl explosion in the soviet union and still be completely oblivious to it because there was like no freedom of the press yeah. and then like uh just for maoism uh like it has very similar aspects of, like stalinism in general and how like he was trying mao was trying to uh and with a great leap forward industrialized china and everything but that still led to like huge famines with like 35 to like 50 million dead and everything similar yeah. to like the ukrainian famine and it's just i just wanted to mention maoism since it's like the reigning supreme version of communism in the modern era since you know yeah the is still, is still around well i i would say yeah. I, I would say you're right uh, I, I would say China now is more state capitalist, uh, state capitalism rather than rather than actual communism. Um, but there are still significant Maoist elements where, you know, you don't want to criticize the government. Right. I mean, uh, the, I don't remember the name of the human rights activist, but he was the one who initially made the comparison of Xi Jinping and Winnie the Pooh in their appearance. Uh, I mean, like he died in prison for doing that. It's crazy. Um, yeah. Okay. So Stefan, this is a good point that you've brought up. And I think that this is one of the reasons together with their, their rigid technocratic approach, you know, no freedom of the press, do what big brother says blah 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 uh together with the fact that you know the 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 soviet economy was a lot smaller than the american economy right so they're trying to compete with the american military and they have to spend as, as uh, stefan says way more of their gdp on the military um if if they had done like the united states and and if they were spending that money on consumer goods or people were were, were, were earning that money and spending it on consumer goods, their economy would have been a lot better. Um, and yeah, 3% of the GDP on the military in the US. Granted, the, the, the United States has an, an, an absolutely massive economy. It's, it's crazy. Nowadays, Russia's economy is actually much smaller than you'd think. Um, I think it's about the same size as the economy of Spain, which... <laughs> I mean, think about it. You wonder why Putin is always saber rattling. Uh, it's posturing. Um, yeah, smaller than California. So interesting. Definitely interesting. So anyway, I guess, uh, yeah, um, technocracy, right? Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes does not. Um, so when we come through to the 1960s and 70s, we start to, to hear from Western thinkers who advocate this theory, a theory of post-industrial society. And here Duzek says, post-industrial society theory is a kind of technological determinism. We're gonna talk about that more in chapter six. It claims that various forms of the technology of industrial production produce different forms of social rule. In this respect, it is like Marxism, but it rejects Marx's socialism and communism for a prediction of the coming technocratic rule in post-industrial society. Interesting. It's very interesting because, um, ah, I can't seem to move, oh, there we go. It's very interesting because, you know, this is one of those points at which we have to ask ourselves, are we in, ah, are we in control of technology? as my, <laughs> I ask this as my slides are jumping around uh, willy nilly, I'm unable to control them. <laughs> so, you know, uh, a lot of thinkers uh, bring this up. We think, and we've, we've encountered this idea before in this very book, right? If, if technology is just a tool or applied science, 
It's morally neutral. It's neither good or bad. It's just what we do with it. But the assumption there is that we're actually in control of technology. Uh, on this thesis, we are not exactly in control of technology. Technology is just kind of doing its thing. Uh, and we get kind of swept up with it, right? So on this theory, uh, societies develop along the following lines, right? We have agricultural first, and then they develop into an industrial phase, and finally into a post-industrial phase. Oh, there's a question here. Uh, James E. Scott, Seeing Like a State is an interesting book detailing the errors that strictly modernist practices of governance were prone to. Definitely some overlap with too narrow technocratic thinking. Really just a whole list of bad examples. Uh, USSR framing is farming is a central example. No, no, that's uh, that's really good. Thank you for that, Tess. Um, I think I would like to read that. I like history. I like politics. Uh, I imagine a fair amount of you do as well. So that's a good, that's what's it called again? Seeing like a state. Okay. I'm going to, yeah, thank you, Tess. I'm going to keep that in mind. That sounds like an interesting read. So we're going from agricultural to industrial to post-industrial. Agricultural societies are what they sound like, right? We're mostly farming. Uh, <laughs> smiley face. We're mostly farming. Um, we So we've got peasants, serfs. Uh, these are people that are tied to the land. Um, you know, there, uh, there are landlords, not like landlords, like my landlord who won't fix the leaky roof, but like landlords who own the land and they let you live there if you farm it. And if you farm it, you get to keep some of what you farm to feed yourself and the rest you got to give to your landlord, right? It's, it's a feudal system. Um, after that, societies develop into industrial society. Instead of peasants and lords, you have blue collar workers, right? You have the proletariat, as Marx said, and you have the capitalists who own the means of production. The capitalists have all the capital, the money and the means of production. And I go to work and I work for a salary if I'm a blue collar worker, right? It's like when I worked at uh, Tim Hortons, right? I worked there when I was an undergrad. And I worked there when I was a grad student. Ooh, terrible job. And my owners are capitalists. They own the restaurants. And they own all the coffee machines. All the beans, right? Uh, all, the, all the stuff I need. I can't just go open a coffee shop. I don't have any coffee beans. I don't have a place to set it up. I don't have any coffee machines, right? I don't have the means of production. But I have labor. I can give my labor. So I sell my labor for time, right? I'm a worker. Um, but the capitalists make most of the money, right? That's where the wealth is, is, is if you're a capitalist. Then in post-industrial society, there's still a lot of capitalism going on. But really what we start to see a shift in is instead of blue-collar workers, we get more educated workers managing automated machinery. Now, here's an interesting question. Are we fully there right now in the West, for lack of a better term, the West? Are we, saying Canada or the United States, are we fully post-industrial yet? I think we're on our way there. We're definitely on our way there, but I don't know if we're fully post-industrial yet. I think we're still kind of making that if, I mean, with the caveat, if this is actually correct, you know, uh, if this way of looking at things is really good, are we fully post-industrial or are we just kind of working on it? I think we're working on it. And I'll tell you why, because even though we don't have a lot of manufacturing stuff happening in Canada at the moment, just to use Canada as an example, um, we still, uh, a large part of our economy depends on um, at the extraction of natural resources, right? So uh, let's see what people are saying. Stefan says, we have, a, we have incredible amounts of automation like self-automated registers and retail store. Yep, that's probably like a spectrum, 
still lots of potential for changes. Yeah, I'd say you're right. Like we're starting to see it. Um, there's there's automated checkouts or like at an Amazon warehouse, there's robots as well as human workers, right? The Amazon warehouse, probably uh, that's a great example of where we sit right now, right? We're, we've got workers and we've got automated machinery. So uh, let's just see, I'll, Max, I'll get, I'll get to you in just a moment. I'm just gonna answer Abraham's question, which is, is post-industrial saying that all workers operate automated machinery? Yeah, I think like in a true post-industrial society, yes. Uh, we would all be kind of like technicians, like, you know, to go back to the coffee shop example, in the future, you go to Tim Hortons or Starbucks, wherever, to get your coffee, uh, you're getting it from a machine or a robot. And the only people that are working at Tim's or Starbucks or wherever are the people making sure those machines keep working, right? In a true post-industrial society, that is. Uh, Max, go ahead. Hey, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, I don't think we're really at post-industrial yet because, um, well, part of it is what you said about Canada being reliant on natural resources. Like, it's it just in terms of our geographic placement, we're just incredibly advantageous with our forests and our, our fresh water, really, and our oil. So mm -hmm. not only do we rely on these to, like, remain relevant, but also so do our machines. Like, the actual machines that we have, like, sure we can have them be self-automated and have some level of autonomy but i think because like they're not really building themselves yet and they really do require a lot of human effort and labor not just for maintenance and a tim hortons but to like actually like build them and engineer them and uh at the end of the day you can also just like you know pull the plug out because they're relying on electricity um and that yeah. electricity is generated by whatever like hydro or gas like it doesn't matter like the, um, it all ties into the resources and the well, they're relying on us to get to them. So yeah, I don't want to say they are relying on us to get to them <laughs> because like, it's like not really, not to personify technology, but. Yeah, but yeah. it's true. Uh, even the technology we build that people have to be experts to use, uh, there's the users are not technicians, you know. Here we're talking about like a logger who knows how to use this, really complicated logging machinery or like someone who works in a mine right um and maxine says uh oh you don't think so yeah okay there's still a lot of blue collar service workers yep yeah not everyone is a technician in our economy absolutely right i'm thinking of myself uh even even in my own family right um i'm i'm um i'm kind of more like a technician i'm here um, I'm at the university, I'm teaching, whatever. Um, my father uh, still drives heavy machinery, right? Uh, he works in, uh, up in the mines, uh, driving around uh, like the biggest dump trucks you've ever seen. Seriously, like the wheels are like two of me tall, right? Gigantic dump trucks. So and, and, you know, even if we in the West start thinking, like, if we, we move over to a fully post-industrial society, you know, we're still dependent on the labor and resources of other places, you know? Like, if, ever, if, if everything is robots and self-driving cars, the raw materials have to come from somewhere, right? We need precious metals to make these things to make the, the circuit boards, the batteries, all this. We need precious metals. Where do we get those? Well, we've got to mine them, right? And a lot of this is actually mined uh, in, in, you know, like, uh, you know, developing countries like the Congo. Uh, a lot of precious metals being mined in the Congo. Um, so, yeah. What else? I want to kind of get to a discussion and then I get, and then I'm, then I have to make a decision on what I'm going to do with my other class. Sorry, I keep talking about it, but it, it's weighing on my mind. Uh, okay, let's read this and then we'll get to a bit of discussion. So Dizik says on page 50, the technocracy thesis huh, for post-industrial society has a simpler and subtle, uh, subtler form. The simpler form 
is that the stratum of technocratic experts, what uh, Galbraith calls the technostructure, directly rule, replacing traditional politicians and business leaders. The subtler form suggested by Galbraith is that politicians and corporate chief executives are dependent for information uh, on the basis of which to make decisions on numerous lower level technical experts, scientists, engineers, accountants, economists, political scientists, psychologists of propaganda and the media and so forth. This is the subtler form. Um, so there's a simple, a simple form and a subtle form. And maybe keep this in mind as, as we explore these questions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, think of, um, you know, think of like Elon Musk, who, I'm sorry I'm making you think of Elon Musk. Um, Tula, shush. Oh, I didn't even know you were in here. Hi. Sorry, my dog's barking. I didn't even see you there. What were you doing there? What were you doing there? Yeah. Um, you know, Elon Musk, right? Oh, God, Elon Musk. Yeah, not a fan. You know, first he was all cool. Like, everyone thought he was, was, was the shit, right? Oh, electric cars. Meh. Uh, God, what a, like, seriously, though, what a chode. Um, and a lot of, a lot of people have a mistaken impression of him. Like, like he's some kind of, uh, <laughs> like he's some kind of genius, you know? <clears throat> yeah. People thought he was like a Tony Stark. No, he's not. You know, he is not inventing electric cars. He is not building the rockets. He's got people that do this. He pay, hires and pays engineers to do this, right? Apartheid funded, really? Oh, I don't want, what's up was, oh, his dad. I know his dad, I know he and his father don't speak, but hey, Tula, you don't like Elon Musk either. Yeah. Okay, yeah, South African, right, yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And in that regard, he's really just like a Trump. He's really like a Donald Trump. Yeah. Huge subsidies from the government. Doesn't want to pay taxes. Yes, uh, Dominic, I think you're right. If there's one good thing you can say about him, it's that he is that through Tesla, he is making a push for green technology but he didn't start that company he didn't invent the electric car obviously um yeah and and like max says the teslas he makes aren't even green those precious metals i was talking about um uh you know you need lithium for these batteries you've got to mine lithium that is not a good that is not good for the environment and it happens in developing countries right and yeah, proprietary charging stations. Yeah. 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 So, so like Elon Musk, uh, well, you know, uh, my point is without getting, you know, without all of us raging against uh, Elon. Oh, all his jokes. I think all his jokes are bad. Yeah. Yeah, right. Like, so, so, okay. So Elon Musk um, is, is very much just the guy at the top. Um, he's the commander, he's the captain of the ship, whatever. Um, but even somebody like him, who initially we, you know, kind of uh, spun his image as, you know, kind of like a Tony Stark, he's not. Um, uh, he he relies on the expertise of the people who work for him, you know. <clears throat> um, can we say the same about most leaders of big corporations? Good at hiring skilled people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good point. What's another great uh, another great example? Uh, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, right? Uh, CEO of Apple, and and then and they fired him. And then later on, he came back and was CEO again until he died, right? Um, one of the most successful tech CEOs 
um, during his lifetime. And uh, thought of all kinds of really cool ideas, you know, uh, the, the, the iPod, the iPad, you know, these are great ideas. These, uh, these, uh, the iPhone, these revolutionized uh, things. Um, Steve Jobs didn't write code. Steve Jobs could not code, right? Um, that's what Woz was for. The Woz, Steve Wozniak. He was the engineer. He was the coder. He was the guy making the technology. Jobs was the idea man, right? Musk is like that, but maybe more of a jerk, right? <laughs> oh God, I hope Elon Musk doesn't see this and, and offer me $5,000 to shut up. I don't know. Or have me killed. I don't know. World richest man. What, what's he going to do? Could wake up dead tomorrow. Anyway, yeah, Steve Jobs, he has the idea. Like, oh, what if, what if we had computers in our houses, man? Because he was a bit of a hippie. And then Steve Wozniak's like, oh, yeah, well, you know, let's build it. Build the Apple computer. Um, so I would say definitely. How's, how are we doing for time? Oh, still, still doing well. Now I want to talk. I wanted to talk briefly about technocracy in relation to the pandemic, and I think it's pretty easily, uh, pretty easy to apply some of what we've learned to the pandemic. Right? Technocracy. Remember, rule by technical experts. Um, the pandemic has it featured more technocracy, or has it just made technocracy more visible? And why? Are some people for or against what is happening right now with our efforts to manage the pandemic? And if you don't want to answer these questions and if you just want to jump in with your thoughts, that's okay as well. You can use the chat, you can use the, the voice camera thing, whatever you like. If nobody goes, I'll offer some thoughts, but I'll let you know. Okay. Anibale, go ahead. And then Max. Yeah. Just so, again, I don't really have an answer, I guess, for all of them. I guess more of the last one. Like, why are some people for or against? And it's very, I guess, the difficult question, especially because we've been two years in the pandemic, well, almost two years in the pandemic and whatnot. And there's been a lot of uh, influences, mainly, I guess, by experts on, you know, which vaccines to use, you know, you should use this. And then the next week you should use this one. A month goes by. Maybe it's yeah. not the best idea after like some, you know, results and stuff, but like, so I guess it's really a mix. I'm on the line against for or against because in a sense, uh, I feel like sometimes when it's just the rule of like the best say from technical experts, it's definitely a quicker approach compared to the democratic view of it. Uh, yeah. it's, it's not but in the same sense depending i guess on the technical experts uh and their how do i say it's not empathy but like is it is the techno expert focusing on say what is the best results and lacking the care of the people themselves or is it more of like i don't know how to explain it but i guess my stance for that question is uh i guess i'm on the line for for or against the techno technocratic approach uh, yeah fair enough um i mean uh yeah i i think that i think yeah i mean you you raise a good point like especially with how quickly things were developing with the with the whole pandemic situation you would hear conflicting advice uh i remember at first uh masks were not emphasized uh and then as we got into it uh the, the advice became oh you should wear a mask because it may help uh it might not protect you but it may help protect other people right so you know the situation evolved for sure um uh, how about max you go ahead and then i'll get to some of the questions and comments in the chat uh i think that there's definitely a lot of technocratic elements but i I'm just kind of hesitant to really call anything like super technocratic if it's just like we are relying on experts and we're using technology and we're using medical technology and we're using our 
governmental resources to hopefully best like export uh, vaccines or whatever, or um, create laws and mandates based off the advice of experts. But like, it just kind of seems like more common sense than technocracy to be like, oh, they're super like in control. And it's like a huge like bureaucracy of, of experts that are really making the decisions. It's, it's, it's really just more like they're given the platform to speak and then the uh, the people that actually hold the power make the decisions. So it's mm. it, it really seems just more like common sense and like a more advisory role than anything that's yeah, if that's a if that's, if that's a major part of technocracy and I'm I have a bad definition, that's my bad, but no, it kind of seems like it doesn't seem that we don't need to put a huge label on it. It just seems like the normal response has already been built into our like into our procedures already. Like yeah, um, the quarantine act had already existed before, for yeah. example. And I think you're right. Like um, it's true because we've seen some, even if you just restrict um, like your view to Canada or the United States, like we've seen experts uh, make recommendations and then have them not be followed. Right. Which I think speaks to that advisory role that a lot of them play. Um, so let's see, let's go to the chat. Um, yeah. Uh, Emily, this caught my attention right away. Trust, lack of trust in experts, which I think you can see. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know where the problem lies here. <sighs> probably a, a mixture of um, problems with science education and people with agendas, uh, people pushing agendas, like people in the anti-vaccination movement, I mean, uh, are, often, are often pushing a political agenda. Um, and I think that both of these factors feature into, I guess, if you have a lack of trust in experts. Um, because uh, as Max said a moment ago, you know, the kind of technocracy it seems that we've been stuck with here is a sort of advisory sort of technocracy where the experts advise, um, they are not ruling, um, you know, but you have like Dr. Fauci uh, say, you should wear masks. And then Donald Trump doesn't wear one uh, when he uh, has COVID and goes back to the White House or something, right? So, you know, um, Let's see what else we've got here. Um, can I just do this? Oh. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. I think the big doctors like Fauci in the US or even Theresa Tam in Canada definitely played a larger role in decision-making than they would have pre-COVID. Yeah, exactly. Um, not, that they were the, not that they were the source of authority, um, but they were, they, they were and still are absolutely we're deferring our leadership is deferring to people like them uh because their expertise is so relevant right now right um uh, Steph, uh Stephen says i think technocracy is being both challenged and validated health experts oh, have influenced policy fairly well in spite of backlash at times yeah their successes seem to make technocracy more visible yeah i mean it's not like um it's not like we're not doing the same sort of thing uh, when there's not a pandemic. We are. It's um, in all kinds of areas. Um, but yeah, uh, the pandemic, I think, has just really made certain technocratic aspects of society more visible, as you say. I think that's a good way to put it. Um, Oh, Zach, you're right. Yeah, when I said the mask thing, yeah, that is true. Because there were supply shortages. You're right about that. Uh, before I go on, um, uh, Vin uh, Vicente raised his hand. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah, I just wanted to... Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Wanted to mention a, an example from another thing that I saw on YouTube. It's not the best source, but it was a great video. <laughs> the thing is that they get together scientists and people that uh, believed in flat earth and they made them like try to come to a common ground. 
And at the very end of the video, after one of the scientists went really hard on these people and he was telling them like, you're dumb, you don't know anything and stuff like that. Other scientists said like, bro, like this is kind of our fault too. Like if we have all this evidence and we can show it to people so they believe us, like, are we doing our jobs right like is yeah. it our job to just build knowledge for ourselves or, or are we supposed to also be able to give it to people and the people who can believe us that's a that's a great point and i think i've seen that video um but it's true uh i mean scientists at uh, not just scientists but technical experts i think ought to have this responsibility um to get out of the ivory tower right Knowledge is for everyone. I really believe that. Knowledge is for everyone. That's why I put these lectures on YouTube. It's not just so that you guys can watch them later. It's because knowledge is for everyone. Um, and yeah, if, if technical experts are like, yeah, I've got to wonder, like, how on earth? I, I understand, yes, there is a, a misinformation campaign about, you know, vaccines and autism, which is largely pivoted now um it's it's actually pivoted i've noticed this during the pandemic uh pre-pandemic it was oh vaccines cause autism now it's mrna vaccines are new and they change your dna right it they've it's flipped um but still the fact that these theories are promulgated and believed speaks to the fact that uh people are not scientifically literate enough uh, to know the 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 truth from the from the nonsense, uh, and whose fault is that? Well, in part, it might be the experts, because, I mean, geez, they've got to communicate this stuff, right? So yeah, I'm gonna read Thomas's question here. I think we need to be careful that our experts don't get tunnel vision. For example. Doctors will primarily focus on health, which is obviously important, especially during a pandemic, but may not have expertise, uh, may not have the expertise to balance these things with other ideals, like democratic systems and freedoms. Yeah, that's a good point, right? I mean, some doctor might say, we just need to lock everybody down, circuit breaker lockdown for three weeks, but um, maybe uh, that will adversely affect mental health uh, or, or in, infringe on somebody's rights, you know? Like I remember, um, man, it was December. I was going to go see Unleash the Archers playing at the Brass Monkey. It was going to be awesome. I was going to really like, ugh, gonna, 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 gonna go see some metal. And then the Omicron wave hit. And what, what were we supposed to do, you know? Um, but I gladly gave up my evening out um, uh, because, well, it wouldn't have been safe. Everybody, everybody, everybody had to cancel. Right. So, you know, these are things that we enjoy. We, we're free to do th uh, certain things, go to movies, go to concerts. And we may have to stop doing that for a bit. Uh, sorry, Max, you have your hand up there. Um. Yeah, I think when it comes to like, you know, being able to balance like it, it is a balance of like human rights and uh, you know social pleasures or you know, things that we're used to before. But yeah, yeah at the same time, like, uh, this there's like a, a social adjustment that needs to happen. But I, what I originally wanted to say uh, is that in regards of like whose fault it is that people don't have as much scientific literacy. Um, I think it's not just the experts that are at fault because uh, people sometimes don't have time to read things. People yeah. don't have the opportunity to have these resources available to them. There's a lot of other barriers aside from like, there's like paywalls, for example, but also it's just like not everyone has the time to go and specialize in a specific medical field Yeah, uh, or some people don't have the time to or, or, or grew up in a location where that wasn't necessary like there's just this is a lot of different factors and a lot of it's relating to i don't know if i take an anti-capitalist approach i would say a lot of it is relying on like the need to work and yeah. the lack of free time to pursue these things um, i i i, I you know. agree i agree i mean i'm thinking of like somebody like maybe like a single mom who is working two jobs um 
uh, and maybe she hears from a friend like, oh, these new vaccines are bad. Um, and she trusts that friend. She's going to just take that. Uh, she's, she's going to uh, believe that testimony. Uh, because yeah, she, she doesn't have time to go and learn all the medical science, right? Um, I think people just listen to who's close to them. So it's like if your yeah. family has been like this for a long time, that's how you were raised and you don't have the time to break out of that or it wouldn't be beneficial to you. Like that could implicitly affect how much you want to retain. Or if all your friends are like this, then, you know, I, I just feel there's a lot of social and like, you know, economic mobility factors that affect yeah. like whether or not someone like has this just took time like i know it's like a very arbitrary factor to like to pin down but like reading and like learning and understanding like takes time and there's just other activities aside from you know levels of complexity like yeah yeah it's there. true it's true well that's that's what schol scholarship the root of that word is scole which means leisure time so no you, you've nailed it uh i think that 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 sums it up there uh uh, what time okay better finish up the questions in the chat and then we'll probably we'll probably have to wrap it up um maxine says experts are not the best uh, leaders or policy makers just yesterday the white house of science advisor resigned because he was making the executive office a toxic environment oh interesting and there's the story there so yeah i'll have to check that out um but yeah, that's that's a very real possibility too, right? That the, the, he could he might be an expert, but he could be uh, an asshole, right? <laughs> um, uh, just a toxic workplace. Absolutely, that that that's a thing that can happen. Eric Lander was his name. I'm gonna have to come back to that. Or Ian Lander, Eric or Ian? Yander, I don't know. Anyway. I'll check that story out. Um, I think one of the major differences is how the experts are being put on the news instead of just giving advice um, behind closed doors. Yeah, that I do agree with. I think I think um, I think that's good. Um, I think that we should be able to hold the science advisors um, accountable uh, and ask them questions in the same that, way that we do with politicians. Unfortunately, that that that's also abused. Um, sometimes if you see some of like, um, like the exchanges between uh, Anthony Fauci and Rand Paul, if you want, if you follow American politics, um, you know, Rand Paul, I think is not acting in good faith when he asks Fauci questions. Um, and and is using his uh, his his platform to spread misinformation, uh, and that's unfortunately a worry. But beyond that, yes, I think it is a good idea to to sort of have these experts out in the open, where we can actually have a discussion, right? Uh, oh. Okay, so Henrique agrees with Stefan. From a technocracy standpoint, it seems to validate the collection of data and use of technology to justify a more autonomous and personal way of making decisions while also undermining, oh, undermining. Ah. Undermining democracy if we analyze the role that social media, for example, has played in shifting public opinion. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, there's an example of autonomous technology, if there ever was one. Social media algorithms. Um, for example, seeing how China was able to contain the pandemic compared to other uh, countries and the technology that allowed uh, makes you to think about the repercussions. Uh, that, yeah, I mean, well, um, I think that's a good point. China did seemingly contain this very well, and they did it um, by by using some pretty extreme measures. I mean, you were locked in your house essentially at certain points of the pandemic, right? Uh, that said, um, China has also not been uh, that transparent about all of this either. So we could question whether they've handled it as well as they have, uh, because when COVID initially uh, got out, uh, the the party line was uh, oh we've got it under control no big deal um so yeah just just saying that's that's one thing 
Um, oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, South Korea has handled this well in some regards. I have a friend there right now. Um, they're very good at the social measures, but the vaccination is, 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 is lagging a bit behind. Um, but anyway, uh, but hasn't scientific been bogged down by access to? It's much easier to access a Facebook post with COVID skepticism compared to reading the most recent um, COVID studies, which are uh, which are behind a paywall anyways. Yeah, exactly. That's I think that's correct. And on this point, uh, I'm just going to make this bigger. <coughs> I think a decent amount um, of the issue is that people cannot understand the science. Instead, they choose to believe their friend's family favorite politician. Yep, that's testimony. That's the power of testimony. Uh, Tess, not sure you agree. Let's see. I totally do think that proper science communication and education is absolutely vital, but I'm not sure that it should necessarily be the responsibility of, let's call them frontline knowledge creators. I like that. My thought is that knowledge communication is its own field where people can develop expertise and that skill in that field is, an, is uh, orthogonal uh, to being a scientist. It might be personally beneficial for an individual to try and diversify their skills, but that's not what's best for the field or best for the, yeah, okay. Actually, uh, Tess, I think that's a really great point. And um, I agree, there is a difference between an effective uh, scientist and effective science communicator. I mean, think of Bill Nye the science guy, right? He's a great science communicator, but technically he's an engineer, right? He's not doing physics or chemistry. He's an engineer, but he's a great science communicator. I think the best science communicator of all time has got to be Carl Sagan, um, who was also an excellent scientist. So, you know, you can be a great science communicator and you don't have to be a good scientist, or you can be a good scientist and a good communicator. But I think it's true. Knowledge communication may be its own skill, and maybe what we need is for more people to step up and be good communicators of that knowledge. Um, Max wrote a paper. Uh, oh, sweet. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I'm going to check that out. Uh, I'm going to check that out on ResearchGate. Thanks. Thanks, Max, for sharing that. And yeah, like I was saying earlier about Rand Paul, throwing med reach to his bits for no reason, since he's actually trained in the medical field. Exactly. He's an ophthalmologist, isn't he? An eye doctor. But like you say, it's easier for politicians to deflect blame to the experts during this pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. And like I was saying, I, I would say when it comes to, yeah, some of the stuff I was talking about, Maxine, yeah. It's probably just authoritarianism. If you get to the point where you're not allowed to leave your apartment building, um, that seems pretty authoritarian. Because is that really grounded in anything scientific? I mean, nowadays, uh, it's fine. At this stage, in the, later on in the pandemic, you know, it, uh, we, could, we, can, uh, we can leave our place. No problem. I remember initially that first summer, uh, we were lining up outside of the grocery stores because they were trying to limit the number of people indoors. Eventually, they stopped doing that because just fewer people were grocery shopping at any one time because they didn't want to be out in big crowds. Um, so, yeah, um, that's a fair point. That's probably not technocracy there. Uh, it, it's the authoritarian um, style of government. Well, I've got 1251 here. Um, next time we're going to start up chapter five. Um, but that's all for today. And I think that was a pretty cool discussion. There was a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, ah, no, don't pause. Resume. Huh. Yeah, there's a, a, why, why was he doing that? Oh, whatever. Anyway, yeah, uh, good, good class, everyone. That was fun. Um, a lot of uh, stuff. Everybody, uh, be sure to check out that CNN uh, article that Tess shared. Uh, and Max's paper, too. That sounds pretty interesting. I'm going to go read that later on. I think that's pretty cool. Um, 
It sounds very much in the same vein as what um, what Liam is working on right now, our teaching assistant. Um, misinformation, social media algorithms. Max, maybe you should uh, talk to Liam. Maybe you guys would put your heads together and um, talk about some interesting stuff together or indeed anyone else. Um, okay, uh, that's enough for today, I think. I have to figure out... Uh, yeah, yeah, Max, Liam is on Discord. So you can, I mean, not that I'm saying everybody go overwhelm him. He's very busy right now. He's grading your assignments, uh, but he is on Discord. He is on the server, so you can go chat chat to him there. Uh, but I got to go figure out what I'm doing with my class tomorrow. I, I got to go watch some news, everyone. I got to see how weird, how, how, how funky it is downtown um, and uh, make a decision. So I better end it here and uh, I'll see you all on Thursday. We'll talk about chapter five. Um, yeah, thank, thank you guys. Thank you, everyone. The class was good today and the discussion, well, the class is always good, but uh, I always like the discussion. So let's do more of this. I'll try and make it so we do more of this in the future, more discussion. So cheers, everyone. Take care of yourself. Stay safe out there if you're out and about. Um, Oh, Julian. Yeah. It's just about my other class. It, nothing to do with this class. It's about whether I teach my other class in person because of the uh, protest that's going on downtown. Um, that's what I have to think about. I'm just thinking out loud. Don't mind me, everyone. Don't mind me. Anyway, bye, everyone. Now have a good week, and I'll see you Thursday. Take care. Ta-ta for now. End transmission.